recording, Diana. Thank you. Okay, so here we go with the, the eighth Bir Trusted CI Virtual Institute session. And we have Andrew Cordy presenting on Swift and Reasonable Action, a higher ed CISO's perspective. Um, and I want to give Vaughn a chance to say anything if he needs to. Yeah, thank you, Dana. I'll just uh, uh, briefly introduce Andrew. So I uh, thank Andrew for coming on. He's the uh, Chief Information Security Officer here at, at Indiana University. Uh, in that role, he provides executive leadership and oversight for strategies, plans, policies, and processes for the security of technology and information systems of both institutional and personal data uh, here at IU. And his team, uh, the Indiana University Security Office, is responsible for standards administration, technical risk assessment programs, security reviews, consulting, technical security resources, and technical response to security incidents for all the IU campuses across the state. And uh, Andrew originally got his, uh, his bachelor's of science and physics from Purdue University. And I just wanna thank him for coming on. I know we've had uh, a number of folks presenting to you from more of the research perspective, but I intentionally invited Andrew here because almost all the research that's done in the, in the United States, at least if not globally, is embedded in higher education uh, universities and institutions. So I thought it was very important for us to get some perspective uh, coming from within those higher education institutions. So with that, I'll turn things over to Andrew now and thank him again for joining us this morning. It's all yours, Andrew. Thank you, Vaughn. And thanks for, to everyone for being here today. I'm going to try to give you, as Juan said, the perspective of a higher ed CISO, as well as some insight into our operations at IU. Uh, and I'm gonna start with a metaphor. Um, I can get my, there we go, slide to advance. Uh, so in Germany, they have these brilliantly designed treetop walks. They start at the ground level, uh, but they end up being quite high up in the trees as you proceed. Now I'm afraid of heights. So when I was on one of these with my family, I was at all times either sort of hewing toward the exact center of the path uh, or clinging to one rail or the other. Uh, but in contrast, you can see how my daughters are perfectly comfortable and uh, much better able to enjoy what the view has to offer. You can see they're kind of saying, come on dad, but in typical security guy fashion, I could imagine all kinds of additional safeguards that would have reduced risk. And I could imagine myself as a safety expert in the boardroom of the company that designed these at the time and arguing that uh, all these additional controls be implemented. But I would have been wrong. Uh, there is a correct level of safeguards in this application and the Germans have found it perfectly. Never forgetting the reason for doing the project in the first place. Can you imagine if a safety expert had pounded on the table in that design meeting, insisting on solid walls? Uh, not only would the treetop walk be far less useful and enjoyable, but it would have led to unintended consequences like people climbing up the walls to get a better view putting themselves at greater risk. But this is how I approached information security when I started in the field 20 years ago. Eventually I learned that I needed to keep the organization's vision in mind when designing safeguards. If nothing else, it helps to do that when you're trying to sell those safeguards to other leaders in the organization that don't have the same sort of risk mindset that you do as CISO. But I'm not trying to downplay the threats that we're facing. Uh, in fact, most people underestimate them or assume that their, uh, their employer, their bank, their government, et cetera, is protecting them. And now to some extent that's true, but there's still plenty of residual risk, risk that's left over after uh, your employer or bank does all they can do. When faced with these threats, 
we can't hem and haw, we have to act. And uh, at IU, our top three sources of security incidents uh, continue to increase. And I'll just expand on the first couple here, but we're on track to sustain upwards of 18,000 phishing attacks this calendar year. Uh, and I'll talk about how we defend against those later in the presentation, but these attacks are also increasing in sophistication, such that it's difficult for a user, even an advanced user, to tell whether an email message is real or fake. Now, once an attacker has stolen credentials through phishing, they try to reuse them on other sites. For example, they try to use your Facebook password on your Gmail account. And we've seen an increasing number of attacks trying to reuse credentials against IU. This is why it's important to have different passwords on your various accounts here and throughout the internet. So although our designs for proactive security are very deliberate and balanced, when threats loom, we act swiftly and we're okay with some collateral damage when mitigating risk. This is a note I sent my CIO when we learned of a new vulnerability targeting Mac computers. I'll give you a minute to read it. So in other words, there was a weakness found in Max, and we knew that the attackers would know about it just as, as well as we would. Criminals throughout the world would be aware of it. It doesn't take, they, don't, they didn't have to write any code to exploit it. And so we instantly had a bunch of Macs on our network that were vulnerable. We didn't know what these Macs were. They could be somebody's personal machine or they could have institutional data on them. Uh, but so we knew we knew we needed to protect all of them and we knew that blocking remote uh, management at the border of our network would disrupt some people um, but we believed that the threat was great enough that that we were willing to cause that dis disruption and and so we're taking sort of a new stance this is not a message I would have sent the CIO let's say five years ago. First of all, I would have deferred. I would have said, you know, well, we could do this, we could do that. Um, and we would have taken a week to discuss it and get the word out to everyone. Um, but this is the new sort of stance we're taking. And we're trying to reduce the time between first awareness of a threat and mitigation of that threat. So first awareness was when we learned on Twitter, in this case, Twitter is a great place to learn about new vulnerabilities, um, that this vulnerability exists and, um, and mitigation would be the blocking of it. I'll just go back. So I said Twitter is a great place to learn about new vulnerabilities. You have to, you have to verify that though. <laughs> you can't just automatically believe anything you read on Twitter, right? And that goes double for security vulnerabilities, but you will learn about them there first. So occasionally when warranted, our security staff will use their authority to act. And someone might find that their computer is no longer connected to the network because we've taken it offline, or they can't get to the remote site because they need, uh, the, they can't get to the remote site they need because we've blocked it. Now we do our best to minimize disruption, but when faced with an active threat, we will act without hesitation. So we're not taking our foot off the gas in information security. Uh, if anything, we're flooring it, but uh, CISOs, especially higher ed CISOs, have to put a lot of thought into navigating the vehicle. And to keep all this in balance, CISOs must understand the core business. In higher ed, that's academics and research. And this means going out into campus, talking with researchers, teachers, and other administrators. Again, I look to my daughters for inspiration and my 15 year old makes friends wherever she goes. In this case, a school trip she took to South Africa. The CISO has to form strong bonds with leaders throughout the organization. 
They have to trust you, not fear you. Your job is to protect them and the institution, not antagonize them, not to victim blame when something goes wrong. What is it they say about lawyers? Uh, my wife's a lawyer. Everybody hates them until they need one, and then they're your best friend in the world, right? Um, I'm well aware I'm not always everybody's favorite person at CISO. I come bringing bad news a lot of the time, but I do have a goal of being the one everybody can trust. CISOs must also collaborate with their counterparts at other organizations, even competing organizations. The financial industry has decided they're not going to compete on security. They're working together, sharing intelligence, sharing techniques, uh, evaluating each other, doing reviews and penetration tests of each other. Why would we behave any differently in higher ed, a sector renowned for its collegiality and cooperation? This is the Big Ten Center in Chicago. Uh, I meet face to face three times a year with the CISOs of other Big Ten institutions, but we've been doing this for years and years. Uh, we're a really tight group. Um, usually we meet at each other's institutions, but sometimes we'll meet at this, uh, this Big Ten Center. Um, IU security staff also have regular communication with security practitioners at over 600 other universities through the REN ISAC, which is the Research and Education Networking Information Sharing and Analysis Center. That's quite a mouthful, but what the organization does is pretty straightforward. They facilitate information sharing among security teams at higher ed and research institutions throughout the US and many other countries. It's like having a security team augmented by three or four more staff, just being able to uh, call on this immense body of expertise. Just one more point I wanna make about the mindset CISOs and security practitioners should have, in my opinion. They should not themselves be risk averse. And this is quite a mental leap for us because we tend to be paranoid types, uh, but we shouldn't have too many unusual personal cybersecurity practices. In fact, CISOs should use the same tools and practices as other leaders and security staff should use the same tools and practices as other staff in the organization. I know one security practitioner who had software installed on his computer to detect outbound connections to the internet. It's called Little Snitch. He discovered that Zoom, the software that we're using to stream this presentation, makes some outbound calls occasionally. And even though he learned after investigating this that these were legitimate and the way the software is supposed to work, he wouldn't use Zoom afterwards when he could avoid it uh, because of the possibility of data leakage. This doesn't help the organization. We need him using the software everyone else uses so he can identify vulnerabilities or threats that others may not notice and bring them to the attention of those who can fix them. Likewise, the CISO is not protecting the organization by refusing to use the same kinds of let's say cloud services that the rest of the organization is using. Like a bodyguard, security staff should be right there with whomever they're protecting, maybe even out front. Can you imagine if a bodyguard, you know, was cringing back behind a wall because it's not safe while the person that they're protecting is out among the crowd. So let's shift gears now and take a look at a few operational security initiatives at IU. One we started a few years ago is called Cyber Risk Mitigation. And it's essentially a departmental self-assessment for every department. So IT staff in departments create inventories of all their systems that they maintain, identify the data types stored on those systems and processed by those systems. Describe all the safeguards they have in place like firewalls or um, antivirus uh, and submit the resulting documentation to a peer review team consisting of people from other departments and from central IT. Once consensus is reached that the safeguards are adequate, the dean and the CIO sign off on each department's submission. This is 
similar to the financial sub-certification process that uh, departments undergo at IU and I assume a lot of other institutions. I don't know a lot about that financial process, but it's designed to avoid financial issues and malfeasance at the departmental level. So this part, we run this process every two years and each time through, we try to add a new concept. So this time we've added change management. Um, change management, the, the idea of uh, when you make a change to an IT system, it needs to be documented and reviewed and talked about in a meeting and, and recorded. Uh, we do this well in central, the central IT organization, but we're not sure it, it, it's being done well in departments. And that it's an important security safeguard because um, a lot of times changes to systems when they go undocumented can sort of get lost in the shuffle and you start to lose track of what state your systems are in. And then you get afraid that when it's time to update something, um, like do a security update to a system, you worry because, oh, well, I don't know what the state of the system is. The security update might break something. So we'll just hold off on that security update and then you're behind on security updates. Hey, Andrew, we have a chat question if you're willing. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, we're talking about 150 departments uh, thereabouts. So um, some, and, and these range from very small to very large departments and we do include central IT as a department that gets reviewed so they don't get uh, they don't get a free pass um, some of the departments are maintained by um, uh, like there might be a collection of departments that are all maintained by one IT shop and then that one IT shop will undergo this process and, and handle it for all those departments. So that makes it easier on them. It also encourages departments to, uh, to put their hat in the ring with it, with one of these larger IT groups, which we, um, we, we believe can, can probably serve them better. So yeah, it's a, it's a very big process. We have a, a, a whole team that, that coordinates it. So everyone at IU is well aware that we've implemented two-factor authentication, which we call two-step login for just about everything. So you've uh, probably also seen this with, if not at your institution, you've seen it at your bank or um, internet services like, like Gmail have it now. Uh, at IU, we use Duo Security for two-factor, but there are other products out there as well. Um, Duo has made phishing almost completely ineffective against IU with some caveats. Uh, but even if the phishing itself works, so the attacker sends a phishing message, somebody clicks on it, um, they <clears throat> end up entering their credentials and the attacker then has the, the password. Uh, it's unlikely the attacker can also fake the two-factor, which would require them having access to the, the victim's phone or uh, or key fob or whatever they're using to, to initiate the two-factor. Um, so actually criminals have made advancements in this area and they managed to trick users into approving fake two-factor requests. Um, do a, you might do a web search for charming kitten attacks if you want more details on that. But um, the, the basic way to um, the, the attackers have, have succeeded here is by tricking, um, getting the user to think that they're, they're logging into the real site. And then when they receive the, the duo request, they, they just automatically click approve. One way to thwart this is to look at the location indicated in the duo app. Now, I, I don't know if you can see my pointer. I tried to enable that in my software. Uh, you can, good, um, whoops. Uh, so you can see the IP address that uh, the request came from and the, and the location. Um, so if that doesn't match where you are, 
uh, you, you'll want to click the red deny button. And um, I don't, Duo has this feature, other uh, two-factor technology has this feature as well. Um, it, it doesn't always work if you're, say, if you're using a key fob or if, like I like to use my Apple Watch to approve Duo requests. Unfortunately, you can't, you don't get this information there. But if you're unsure, you can always go to the app and open it up and look. And uh, so if that looks weird, you can click deny. Uh, we have one more question. Um, what are the similarities or differences in cyber risk mitigation between an educational institution and other organizations and businesses? Uh, good question. So I, I can't speak in detail to other organizations and businesses, uh, but I can speak in some generalities. I know that um, very few institutions, educational institutions of our size, have done something like cyber risk mitigation. And most of them have a rather feudal, decentralized IT uh, with many departments running their own IT. So um, I, I think that when, we, when we've presented this at conferences and things, there's an immense amount of interest among security professionals. And I know that they're interested in, in uh, moving this forward at their institutions. I don't know what success they've had. In outside of higher ed, um, the, the limited knowledge I have is that, that most organizations and companies have a much more centralized IT and their security shops work a lot differently. Whereas we provide tools to uh, departmental IT staff and we assist them and we guide them. Um, and occasionally we intervene when the threat is great. Um, we generally rely on them to maintain their own systems. But in a, in a, um, in a uh, corporation, for example, um, the, the security office may have much, a much heavier hand and might be able to say, uh, look deep into all of the systems in the organization. And if they don't make changes, they might go directly to the, the system administrator in charge and say, look, there's this vulnerability, you need to fix it right now. Um, so that's why this is important here. We have to rely to some extent on the departmental IT staff to do the right thing. And we can't, we don't have enough manpower to assess them ourselves, although we will occasionally do uh, onesie twosie reviews of departments. Um, so we really have to rely on them to assess themselves. And then this peer review process allows us to have some uh, advisory role there. I see there's an, a question on two-factor. Uh, do you know anyone using any measure to see how much the two-factor two-way authentication helps mitigate the risk? Well, um, we can't uh, be sure. Uh, let me back up. So, so we know that phishing attacks have gone almost down to zero, successful phishing attacks at IU. We know we're still, we're on track for uh, an all-time high of attack attempts, um, but we know that we've had um, almost zero accounts compromised. We, we can tell when an account gets compromised because even if the, the attacker lies low for a while, eventually they're going to start using the account to do illegal stuff and we're gonna notice. And that's gone way, way, way down almost to zero. Uh, and when we see that an account has been compromised, we can trace it back to a phishing campaign that went on sometime before. We can, uh, we have logs that we can see when a user clicked on a link uh, if they did it on campus. And so we can connect those dots and we know, okay, this user fell victim to a phishing attack. Um, so we can prove or disprove whether it was phishing that got them or not. And we've had close to zero uh, successful ones. The one or two that we've had 
um, the, uh, the person has been tricked into clicking approve. Uh, one that I can remember in recent memory um, was the attacker um, fished the, the victim. The victim clicked on a link in the phishing message, uh, went to a site that looked like our central login site. Um, they entered their credentials. Then the attacker immediately tried to log into our login site, which sent the, the user a duo request. Um, and the user clicked approve. There was another case where an attacker was trying, they didn't fish the user. Well, they did fish the user and got their credentials, but they, they didn't try to log in at that exact time. They tried to log in sometime later. So the user got a duo request at a weird time. Like we're walking down the street, they get a duo request. So they denied it, like they should, Good, like, great job. Um, but the attacker kept trying and they tried different, um, you, can, you can send the request to the Duo app or you can send it to a phone, you can send it to different things as long as the user has those configured. And the attacker kept trying different ones and eventually the user approved it. So they got fatigued, I guess, and they were like, all right, I approve. And then they were compromised, so. Right, so I'll talk about the OmniSock. Uh, earlier I talked about reducing the time between first awareness of a threat and mitigation of that threat. And the OmniSock is one of many of our efforts that are now focused on that goal. A SOC, if you don't know, is a security operations center, which can mean different things to different people. But in this case, it's a team of people who manage systems that detect malicious behavior on networks and then that team responds in some way. The OmniSoc is unique in that it was established by five Big Ten institutions. It's housed at Indiana University, and when a threat is detected at any one institution, alerts are relayed to all the members who can then take action. So if something malicious is detected at Wisconsin, say, I'll be alerted and can take action here to block the remote malicious site um, it, before it even targets us. So this initiative has been quite a success. Uh, in the fiscal year 2019, IU has received uh, many alerts from the OmniSoc, most of which were legitimate incidents that we acted on. And these incidents might have gone on much longer and done more damage had we not had the OmniSoc to alert us. One of the things we struggle with in higher ed, um, as I've alluded to before, is this uh, sort of feudal nature of departments and schools and the lack of centralization. And to be fair, there are many advantages to this arrangement, uh, which is why it, it persists, but administratively, it can be difficult, especially uh, in emergencies. So when a security threat arises, we have to rely on IT staff in 150 different departments, each of which has different procedures and ways of working to take any needed action. And to improve the situation, uh, we developed an extended staff program, which makes security people in departments essentially part of our security office, our central security office. So when a threat arises, we can direct those people to take action in their departments. What's more, they have access to all the tools we have. They hang out with us in our chat rooms and they're basically considered part of our team. So we can also get direct feedback from them on any initiatives we're considering putting forth. This is of great value to us because what we're sitting around talking about as security people Again, we may be coming up with the, the opaque walls on the sides of the treetop walk, right? And then somebody can say, whoa, whoa, that will never, like that, that will never work out, out in, you know, where, where research and teaching is actually being done. Um, so that's been, that's been useful. Um, question about OmniSoc. Um, can OmniSoc be considered to be 
centralized SOC for the 10 institutions or more like a distributed SOC for the 10? Um, I think I understand that question. So um, first of all, it's five institutions currently, um, but that may grow. Um, I would call it a distributed SOC. Well, let me just go into some detail. So um, the, the way it works currently with the five institutions is all of these institutions ha are, are already at a certain level of, in cybersecurity maturity. So um, we all have intrusion detection on our network. So we have systems that are watching the networks and have automated uh, processes in place and patterns that they use to look for malicious activity on the network and alert us. So we don't, they're, they're not like recording or watching everything that's going on. We're not like sitting in front of a screen seeing everything that happens. Um, but we have systems that are automated and they have pa patterns that we, uh, of, of mal malicious traffic so that they can look for just malicious things. And then alert us. So all of the five institutions have that capability and they're sending that all of the alerts from those systems into the OmniSoc. They may also be sending other security information like firewall uh, logs, like the firewall denied this or that, um, or maybe other types of logs like logs for central um, authentication systems or things, things like that, so that they can correlate events. And then in the OmniSoc, they process that and they have ways of viewing that um, to look for specific malicious behaviors. And then they alert the security staff on each of the campuses to take action. Now, there may be some day in the future where they're able to actually take action, like that maybe we've enabled them in some way to to block systems or do something on our campus in a, in a limited way, but we haven't done that yet. Um, but but all, the, all the institutions have to be at this maturity level, um, to, to um, put it in a half-joking way, you have to be at least this high to ride the ride. You can't be, um, you can't have a security team that's just starting out that doesn't have certain capabilities. They may be developing something for that in the future, but, but right now it has to be at that, at that level. So I don't know if I'd call it centralized or distributed, um, uh, but hopefully that, that answers the question. All right, so these are just a few of the initiatives we're undertaking right now, all aimed at reducing the time between first awareness of a threat and mitigation of that threat. And all, uh, all of these are supporting the vision and mission of, of Indiana University. Come on, Dad. So I've tried to give you the perspective of a higher ed CISO as well as some insight into our operations. Uh, this concludes my prepared remarks, but um, I do see one question and I'm happy to answer that and any other that you might have. I'll stop the slides. And first question I see here is, how does the threat intelligence, how's the threat intelligence being shared? Is there any restriction? Um, yes, we're very careful about what we share with the, um, with the OmniSoc. Even though the OmniSoc is hosted at IU, um, we try to um, we try to think about what other institutions, if they were customers, would be comfortable with in sharing. Um, so even though for us it's not really sharing, we know that it is for other institutions, and we try to keep that in mind. Um, we only share alerts. We don't share um, things like we're very careful with things like the content of of communications. We don't even store content. Um, we, uh, we, we only store metadata. So the, where a packet has gone, come from and gone to and what, why it triggered an alert. 
Um, these are the types of things that we share with the, with the OmniSoc. And that's typically all they need to, um, to alert us. And then we might go in and do some deeper uh, investigation once we've been alerted. And that's when we might dig deeper into the data. What is the typical time frame from awareness to mitigation? I'm assuming this depends on the type of threat, its scope, slash intensity, et cetera. Yeah, it depends very, very much on, on the type of threat. Um, it, it's, there, there are a couple things that we have to go through um, when we become aware of a threat. And one of the, the problems we have in higher ed, um, we have this in spades at IU, and, and I think it, it's true all over higher ed, um, we don't know what we have. So there are so many departments, so many activities going on at, at the university. And when I explain it to somebody who works in the corporate world, I say, don't think of us as a, like a company, think of us like a city. We, we don't, we really don't know what's going on everywhere. And, um, you know, someday that might change, but for now we have to behave knowing that we don't know. So um, now that vulnerability with the Max that I talked about, we know we have Max, right? Um, so that's, that's not hard. Do we know how many we have? Um, kind of. Uh, do we know what, which ones of them have sensitive data on them? No, not right away. We, we, might be able to do some digging. We might be able to look at the cyber risk mitigation reviews that I talked about, where the system owners had to identify that um, and get an idea. We might be able to do some scanning and things to find out, but um, off the cuff, we don't have much knowledge there. So when we become aware of a threat, the first thing we have to do is figure out how badly it affects us. Um, there might be a threat in some software that we've never heard of before, but we don't, we still don't know if it's being run somewhere at the university or not. So that's the first step is to, to just figure out whether we're affected. And then um, depending on the type of threat, uh, we, we may be able to mitigate it immediately with a, by, by blocking it at the border or by taking systems offline or it may be much more difficult than that. Um, there's a recent vulnerability that was announced in remote desktop protocol in Windows. And actually we're still, all of us security people are still waiting for the other shoe to drop on that because it's a easily exploitable, wormable vulnerability. It could create a worm. Somebody could create one today, um, but it's been weeks and no one's done it. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting reasons we could go into why that might be, but, um, but we don't know when something like that comes out, we don't know if, if the worm is gonna happen today or in a week. And with this particular vulnerability, it's actually very hard to determine which systems on our networks are vulnerable. So we had to do a lot of work to try to narrow that down. We didn't wanna knock all the Windows systems off our network, that would be too disruptive. Um, we're okay, like I said, with a little collateral damage. And eventually we managed to get the list of affected systems down to, I think, 90. And we blocked them. And I'm sure a lot of people were unfairly blocked by that. And, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but it, we, we had to do something. And we, we took quite a bit of time to get there. So it, it, we have to weigh the risk um, and it, it definitely depends on the threat. Yeah. Uh, next question. What would be desired features? Any wish lists that are more proactive defense? Uh, desired features. Oh, I meant desired features of any capability that can help make your life easier in or with the OmniSoc, particularly for proactive defense. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a laundry list of such features that I'd like to see. Um, so um, I think of a couple examples. One is, one of the things we deal with, I, I mentioned the three top threats that we're dealing with, uh, technical threats. Um, 
One was credential reuse. And the way we see that happening is attackers will scan our networks and they'll find places they can log in and they'll try to reuse these credentials. And you always know they're doing it because they, um, they, they don't even always know what our usernames are. So you'll see a bunch of usernames that we don't even have. They're just, they have a list that they're just trying. And um, I would love it if the OmniSoc could uh, see those and identify when those kinds of attacks are happening and just like block them for us. Um, now this is something that we do now as on our own, but that's one fewer thing that we would have to do. Another example is denial of service attacks. We see a lot of attacks where um, somebody has taken control of a whole bunch of computers out on the internet and they just send bunch loads of traffic uh, to one machine at IU trying to knock it off the network. Um, most of the time, we, we, we have such large network pipes at IU that it doesn't cause a problem, but, um, and most of the time it's gamers that do it. Um, they, they're, they're online gaming and they get mad because somebody killed them or whatever. And so they, they go to a, an internet test service where you can test your website by sending a bunch of traffic to it. Of course, they, they're not testing their website, they're testing our, our poor, unfortunate victim gamer here in the dorms at IU. Um, and that kind of detection, I think, would be great for the OmniSoc to be able to do. And, and they know this, I, I mentioned this to them. And they have a, a list of things I think that they're, they're interested in, in, in providing as well. Uh, not sure if you can comment on this, but do you see unique threats to educational institutions? For example, intellectual property, patents, etc. cetera. Um, e yes. Um, so the, the main type of unique threat that we see is, has less to do with what we do here and more to do with what our weaknesses are. So um, because we try to provide a free and open academic uh, and research environment, we are, the safeguards that we put in place are often a lot more behind the scenes and less in your face than they are in the corporate world. Um, and attackers try to take advantage of that. So they'll, they'll launch attacks on us that, they won't, that you won't see as much in the corporate world. Um, now, we at IU don't do a whole lot of uh, classified research, um, but if we did, I think we'd see a lot more attacks uh, from nation states trying to gain access to that research. Uh, my colleagues at other institutions that do do a lot of uh, classified research see that. Um, and so they have to deal with that. But we, um, so far, we, we have not had to deal with that. To our knowledge, I should always say to, as far as I know, right? Um, there was a second part of that question, I think. Relatedly, are there certain attack trends other than phishing that are shared with other businesses and organizations? Uh, yeah, everybody sees phishing, you're right. Um, Everybody sees uh, physical theft, uh, so binders with information, laptops and things getting stolen from cars. Um, uh, physical intrusions, a uh, little less in, the physical intrusions I think happen, are more targeted in the corporate world. Uh, people going after specific assets whereas in the university world it's more crimes of opportunity people see a laptop sitting there in an office and they grab it um, there are still um, i didn't mention this one but website vulnerabilities are still a huge thing surprisingly i can't believe we haven't solved that problem but um, attackers able to get on a website and type the right stuff into it to make it give you the entire database. 
um, that still happens both at universities and in the corporate world. Uh, for the credential reuse and denial of service, perhaps others, do you see any early indicators uh, which human analysts may be using to anticipate such attacks? Let me think. Yes, for credential reuse, I said before that a lot of times this takes the form of attackers scanning our networks for places they can log in. A lot of times we'll see what we call reconnaissance scans where they're not actually trying to log in. They're just looking for the types of places they can log in. So a lot of times we'll see a reconnaissance scan from a remote IP address and then later we'll see that same IP come back and try to do uh, logins with credentials. Now, most of the attackers nowadays are smarter than that and they'll do the credential attempts from a separate IP address than when they did the reconnaissance scanning. These are all IPs of compromised systems that they've compromised out on the internet. They're not, it's not like they're Comcast IP back at home, unless they're really dumb. Um, where was I? I'm trying to think if there are any other early indicators we might see. Mm, you know, sometimes you might see something on Twitter, if you're lucky, like you might see somebody bragging that they're going to launch a denial of service attack against uh, an organization or institution, especially if they're doing it for notoriety or um, for publicity to try to coerce the institution into doing something. Um, if you're watching Twitter really well, you might see those kinds of things. If you're watching certain chat rooms, you might see some things. We don't usually have the resources to do, to do that sort of thing, but I think that um, I think that in the corporate world, they, they're able to do more of that. Have you looked at AI solutions to help with cybersecurity? Yes. Maybe to prevent attacks, to understand behaviors, or as part of a defense strategy. Um, so we're looking at AI um, and machine learning um, more and more. Um, the challenge right now is that it's sort of operational capability is somewhat nascent, um, despite what you might see from vendor materials. Um, every, every vended product now has to say that it has AI or ML, and it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, this is an area where I have high hopes because, um, as Vaughn mentioned in a talk he gave uh, last week, um, the, the CACR at IU, I think, um, will really be able to help us in this area turn this into something that's more um, usable operationally. And uh, so that's definitely a future item. I do think there's a lot of potential there. And um, right now, it's uh, there. There is there is some capability, um, but it's it's mostly limited to reducing the amount of stuff that a human has to go through. Uh, and that I don't want to downplay that. That's that's really important. Uh, because right now for the human analysts that have to be on the receiving end of the detection capability, it's like drinking from a fire hose a lot of the time. Okay, going back to what you said about attackers targeting universities because of vulnerabilities, et cetera, do they also leverage university networks to conduct other attacks? Oh, certainly. Uh, I'm using a university network to conduct DDoS attacks against other organizations. Um, so yes, an academic institution can be a target, but it, can it also be a con conduit? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, we're always seeing um, attackers use compromised accounts or systems to launch attacks elsewhere. And that's one of the things we look for. That's one of the ways we find compromised systems on our network. Um, they'll be used to launch DDoS attacks, yes. Although we've, we've done a lot to make our network inhospitable to that sort of thing. Um, so there are certain protocols that are useful in launching denial of service attacks. 
they're the kind of protocols when, where, when the client computer asks a question of the server, the server gives back a very verbose response. So when you can trick somebody into uh, thinking they're a server, you can get them in, they can get them to, or when you can tr trick a server into thinking that somebody else is a client, you can get the server to, to send a whole bunch of information at them with very little effort on your part as the attacker. Um, we've disabled a lot of those protocols on our network, so that makes it hard. Um, we've also seen things like um, Bitcoin mining on our network. So it, it, attackers are often using our network and computers to, for reasons other than just our getting our data. And in fact, it may be most of the time it's, it's that. Um, as a, an R1 institution, we have very big uh, network uplinks and we have a lot of computing power. So that makes us a target for that kind of uh, crime. We have some AI ML academic research that might be in line with your interests. Is there an opportunity for us to visit you to understand your needs more and also show you the potential capabilities of our research and get some feedback? Absolutely, I would love to do that. Uh, and I'm uh, sure Vaughn can provide uh, my, my contact info for that. Yeah, I'm happy to help broker that. Okay, thanks. Uh, is OmniSoc noticing and preventing any correlated attacks across multiple institutions? Coming to my centralized versus distributed question, I see that the OmniSoc staff has its own CISO, a dedicated staff. So although hosted at IU, it is acting with its independent staff. Yes, it does act independently. And um, as far as co correlated attacks, I don't know that it has seen any um, intentionally correlated attacks where the attacker says, I'm going to attack all these universities because of who they are. But they definitely see attacks that target multiple institutions. Uh, simply because the attackers are trying to target as many institutions as they can or as many organizations as they can. So I don't know if they've, uh, if, if, if it's been anything as nefarious as we're, we're going to hit, like, like the bank heist where we're going to hit, you know, these three banks specifically. Um, I, I'm not saying that's not happening, but, but that's not something that they found. They found something where it's like, well, we're going to go after this vulnerability wherever we can find it, and wherever we find it, we're going to we're going to capitalize on that. What types of threat trends do you anticipate seeing in educational settings in the near future? Well, I'm concerned about attacks against multi-factor authentication. Uh, like the charming kitten attacks and those have been automated too there are automated tools now that an attacker can use to set up a charming kitten style attack and trick people into clicking approve on that duo screen um, that's going to happen and that's why we have an educational and training component to our um, our phishing uh, program um, and i didn't really talk about that but it's uh, as you might expect, it's basically trying to train people to recognize a fish and um, report it and how to deal with that. Um, but none of this is perfect. You know, I mean, the training isn't either. There, there are a lot of um, fish, phishing messages out there that are really hard to, to distinguish from legit messages. Um, so that's one of my concerns. There are other technologies in this area um, uh, that are that are coming out now that might help. And so we're looking at those. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I, I am worried more, I hate to use the word worried. I, I, I'm uh, interested in what might happen with uh, more uh, confidential research, classified research and nation states and, um, and corporations uh, trying to um, attack and get a hold of, of that kind of research. Um, so I have those concerns as well. 
Um, I, I didn't go into compliance at all, uh, but compliance in itself is a risk, uh, as it were. I mean, you're at risk if, if you're not if you're not following regulatory compliance or industry compliance. You're at risk for um, being fined or being made to stop doing what what you're doing, um, and that's a risk. So we're seeing more and more, um, comp- more and more of a compliance burden in certain areas. Um, and that's a real challenge for higher ed, uh, because of just the, the resources it takes to get there. And, um, uh, so, so I, I have a concern that we may have trouble reaching, uh, achieving compliance in those areas and, and might be at risk there as well. So Andrew, we're, we're reaching the top of the, the hour here. Uh, pardon me, Dana. And um, I don't want to um, uh, push our, uh, our uh, hospitality here. Well, thank you for coming, and I don't want to push your time past the, the hour that you promised. So I'd like to thank you very much. And would it be, if it's okay with you, can I forward you some, some remaining questions in an email? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Okay. Have well, good. Well, thank you very much again. And this has been, I know I was interested in hearing some details from you. I haven't had a chance, so I suspect everyone else uh, was as well. And so thank you for this. And Dana, I'll I'll hand it back to you. Um, I appreciate this very much. It's very interesting. And um, if we'd had time, I'd ask you how well you sleep at night, but (laughs) put that in an email with the rest. I, I actually sleep pretty well at night, um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's, I think it has more to do with um, just a philosophy than, than, uh, than a worrying about risk. So uh, it takes a certain personality to do this job for this long. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for all the great questions from the fellows. It was terrific. Those were great questions. I I enjoyed uh, attempting to answer them. I hope I did a good job of that. So thank you. Thanks. All right, everyone. Um, Until next week, we'll see you then. And thanks, Diana and Vaughn and Andrew for all the work. Bye, guys.